Good morning. Welcome to Tech Innovation with Retail. In Retail. I'm joined by Aaron Gelbard, the CEO and co-founder of Bloom and Wild, the flower subscription company. Audrey Susan, general partner at Ventec, and Susan Lin, partner at Felix Capital. And we're quite tight on time, and obviously it's such a broad sector, there's so much to get into, so we're going to jump straight in. Firstly, I'd like to ask all three of you, if that's OK, um, if in one sentence or a handful of sentences you could sum up the trends that you think are defining are most important in 2024 or something that's particularly under-discussed, then take it away. You can't, I'm, my one caveat is that you can't just say AI. You have to be a little bit more specific than that. <laughs> um, Aaron, would you like to start? Um, I wasn't actually going to say AI. Um, I was going to say two things, both of which are widely discussed. The first one is um, cost of living crisis. Therefore, um, in retail, people are focused on great value for money products more now than ever. And uh, businesses are needing to reorient both their proposition and supply chains and business models around those. Um, but that's not enough for consumers. Um, consumers are also increasingly focused on purpose and ESG type considerations as well. And so designing that into your business model while also creating great value products for consumers seems to be uh, top of mind for us and others. Thank you. Susan, what's defining 2024 for Felix Capital? Um, so I think there's there's two trends, which one is which is quite well discussed, although I think less in the tech ecosystem, and another one which I think is quite under discussed. Uh, the first one is the rise of GLP ones and how that's really changing, you know, not just healthcare but every, the, everything sort of holistically uh, related to that, from you know what we eat, how we're, we're thinking about food, to you know what that means for ve preventative and um, uh, and treatment uh, and uh, and what that means for longevity and lifespans and so I think this is an area where uh, we're just starting to see the, the trends uh, we're just starting to see the the results of that um, I think the next sort of decade will be really interesting to see if um, if GLP ones and the related ecosystem can really sort of um, help uh, spur us towards a much healthier lifestyle and an overall well-being um, I think the second area, which is kind of which is interesting, we've been spending some time thinking about, is the, the large different demographics. So, you know, if you think about overall um, fertility rate declining and the age of uh, of first, you know, people having children um, increasing quite substantially across most of the developed world, what does that mean in terms of um, you know the way that we live, how what will change, and uh, and what's sort of needed from new consumer propositions to answer that? Audrey. Yeah, I think uh, in terms of exciting new areas of development, I would say new materials, uh, especially for retainer, retailers. Uh, it's very interesting to see um, everything which can, we can now make with this uh, sustainability angle, uh, inventing new ways of producing uh, new, new materials. Basically, uh, we've invested in a company called uh, Faircraft, which is doing uh, uh, lab-grown leather, uh, so leather that comes from the DNA of the animal, but uh, that has been grown within a lab. So quite interesting uh, and impressive. And um, this one, I think, is um, is quite big. But we all discussed about that. You were also asking about a trend which is undiscussed. Um, I think a boring part is uh, logistics and um, everything which is about supply chain. And yeah, we don't discuss it anymore because it's been already disrupted a lot uh, during the last five, 10 years. But I think with this main regulation around traceability, uh, all these um, sectors are coming back to the front of the scene and become uh, very interesting as well again. Just thinking a little bit deeper there, do you have any, are there any concrete examples that stand out of particular companies? Sure. Yeah, in the supply chain industry, we've invested in a company called Prewave in Austria, which is uh, monitoring the risk of the supply chain and basically, more deeply, uh, understanding your tier one, tier two, tier three, tier N suppliers because it can, it can become quite complex to follow all your factories, all your basically uh, long tail uh, uh, suppliers that are working with you and to be sure that they are working with the same standards that you as a retailer or the, as an industry or as a manufacturer. So um, being able to um, provide again this big picture, this overview of uh, everything which is happening and where the risk can come from is quite interesting. That's really interesting that you've picked that out, the particular kind of, it does seem like supply chain disruption has been one of those like undergirding 
patterns that this year that investors and founders are, are, are really trying to tackle. And something that stands out in everything that you've said is this attention to consumer needs and what consumers are going through um, and the, the struggles that they're facing. And now that we have this abundance of data, of consumer data, both user-generated and, and things that can be picked up about them via machine learning, um, I'm interested in how how you're navigating that and any techniques or, or softwares that you think are particularly interesting. Aaron, I'll start with you because I think that's something that sets Bloom and Wild apart is their philosophy of, of rigorous data-driven decision-making. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I think it does as well. I guess uh, many people in the flower industry haven't uh, approached it from a sort of data and analytical background, and that was what I did before getting into flowers 11 years ago. And so we have, over the years, really made the effort to gather as many data points as possible about our customers and about our products and our supply chain, which is complex due to perishability, among other things. We've also, over the last few years, um, tried to ask our customers for data in a way that's not just useful for us and useful for them. And I think we, um, in some ways, uh, were ahead of the game on uh, some of the trends now around privacy, for example. So a few years ago, we uh, we came up with the idea of allowing uh, consumers to opt out of marketing specific to occasions which were sensitive to them. And that was something that uh, customers had a, a real need for, but um, nobody in e-commerce was offering. And now everybody offers it. And we've sort of created a movement around it, which we're evolving further um, later this month. Uh, watch this space. Um, and so uh, for me, that's quite important, because I think now there's this whole world of uh, focus on first party data and increasing privacy in, uh, in digital marketing. But if you orient your business model and your relationships uh, with your customers from that, uh, on that basis from an early stage, then I think you're well positioned for when regulations and privacy tighten up. Are there any specific examples of maybe hard decisions that have been made where you've, you've looked at the user data and said, OK, this seems to go against mm. instincts, but we have, to, we have to follow where the data leads? Mm. Yeah, so we, for example, I guess focusing on this same example, we um, will give people the ability to opt out of receiving emails at our peaks, like Mother's Day or Valentine's Day or Father's Day, um, which are the most important commercial moments for us, but which are sometimes very sensitive moments for consumers because they've, they've lost a loved one and that time of year is poignant. So we're foregoing commercial opportunity in the short term by doing so, but I think in the long term we're forming a much deeper relationship with these customers. And they probably wouldn't buy from us for Mother's Day anyway, um, but at least we're not bombarding them with emails about it. So I think sometimes things which are sort of hard decisions um, with a short-termist mindset actually help you build a, a company with better advocacy and, and net promoter score in the longer term. And that's been our approach. Have you seen any qualitative feedback about that? About Masses. Uh, we, um, when we launched Opt Out, we um, uh, we thought that we would have maybe 50 or 100 people um, opt out, and we had 17,000 people um, opt out within 24 hours. It then got picked up in Parliament. An MP, um, who's one of our customers, opted out and talked about bereavement and um, the importance of it to him. It, got, it was all over the press, and so um, masses of both quantitative and qualitative feedback here. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, Audrey, I know that you in particular, you said something that really caught my attention. It was so interesting um, that because sustainability is such a massive focus within, within retail now, and it seems like it's something that's being embedded into you know, every pitch deck and every investment thesis, um, you said that tech is beginning to arise out of constraints as opposed to, to in response to consumer needs. I, wouldn't, I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about how you found the regulatory landscape and what you'd like it to look like in the future. Yeah, well, um, all this sustainability trend is first coming from the consumer, the customers themselves. I mean, they, they want new product, they want more transparency. But at the same time, it's the regulator which is providing this, yeah, these constraints to the retailers, especially, but also to the suppliers, uh, to, tell them, to tell them and to, 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 to tell them how exactly they should provide this transparency and track um, all this supply chain. So could be for a startup quite interesting to say, OK, let's follow the regulation. For example, you have two main regulations in the scope, CSDR and CS triple D. And 
uh, you could say, okay, the regulation just happened, so now I will position my startup so that I will help retailers to answer to the constraints. And that would be great because at some point you get, um, yeah, you, you get growing the same way that the regulation is growing. Mm. It's very dangerous as well because at some time we know that at some point the regulation can change. We know that uh, it can slow down and uh, that maybe uh, there were this and that constraints that were uh, called, but at some point uh, the regulator decided to change and you've built all your product around this regulation and it changes everything. So we've seen companies like growing very fast by surfing um, on regulations, but we've seen also companies dying because of regulation, because they've been waiting for the regulation and it were not coming. So it could be, you know, a two angle uh, strategy. So I would advise startups to basically get back to what customers want. Uh, would it be the end user or the retailers themselves, the, the, the clients, the B2B customers? Because at some point, uh, they will also have an impact on the regulation and they will make lobby to change the regulation if it's too complex for them, for example. They will, they will lobby so that the regulation sh changes or, or that uh, it, it slows down. So um, I, would, I would really push for the startups to get back to the needs uh, rather than to what the regulation is saying. How do you, do you find it difficult? I imagine that that is really difficult because it obviously impedes operations. How does Ventec talk about the balancing that responsibility mm. to to its own kind of sense of ESG principles and obligations, like kind of squaring that with the, the, the complex regulations. And how would, you, how would you design them, I don't know, maybe differently, so that they could still achieve the, the required aims while still serving the, the startup ecosystem? Well, I'm, I'm not the regulator. You know? Yeah, I've kind of put you on the spot there. <laughs> it's not really my job, so um, yeah, I think Everything which is too complex, too hard to implement, anyway, at some point it doesn't, uh, it doesn't conclude or it doesn't stay for long, it doesn't remain. So, um, yeah, I would provide more flexibility, basically, to the ecosystem uh, users and ecosystem uh, players so that they can, um, yeah, that they can get to the goal, uh, which is more transparency or, or uh, more um, yeah, impact within the, the supply chain, but uh, yeah, letting them a bit more space to moderate by themselves. J mm -hmm. Just to jump in here, I guess, I mean, to be fair to the regulators, I think the challenge is, is now there's such an accelerated pace of, of development, and particularly, you know, you see this with, with AI and some of the, the sort of um, this, the lockstep, you know, between regulation and, and the technology development. And I think it's really hard. I mean, it's hard even for, for you know, Audrey and I as investors and maybe Aaron as an operator to stay on top of some of the developments. Uh, regard, and, and, you know, I think for regulators who are, that's not their day-to-day -day job, it's, it's even harder for them to, to understand both, you know, the, how, how the technology is shifting, but the, um, but the broader implications of that. And so I think, you know, they, in, you know, in some cases, I think they are probably trying their best, no well intentioned, but it's just incredibly hard to get the balance right between innovation and, uh, well, not stifling innovation, but still providing some safety guardrails. And then I think that the, the sort of additional complication on top of that is also sort of the geopolitical mm -hmm. complications that you see, um, you know, especially now with, with China and the US, for example, um, you know, the, the um, the, the TikTok ban that is getting discussed a lot in both the US and, and Europe and, and what the implications are, are that there, you know, it's, that's another layer of uncertainty, which, um, and which is, I think, you know, it's hard and harder for startup founders to adapt, but um, on the other hand, also hard for, for regulators to thread that line. And by the way, we are moving a bit away from the retail tech industry, but there is a whole trend around uh, democracy tech. So how do you basically um, yeah, build the regulation, build the law by um, yeah, hearing from the crowd and being sure that you get all the, yeah, all the advice from the operators or from the investors of how it should be created so that there is less friction? Mm -hmm. Susan, that's a really interesting point that you made about the kind of collaboration, the, um, the potential for just more dialogue between, between regulators and startups. Is that something that you've observed at all, like a level of, a level of collaboration on, on regulation that could mean it's slightly more mutually beneficial? 
Yeah, I think there's, I definitely think the, that, um, I mean, I think it probably differs a lot government by government, but I think, you know, at least being here in the, in the UK, we feel that the, um, the UK government is, uh, you know, is, is listening. They don't always get it right. And there's, you know, there's probably uh, more collaboration input that's needed, but I think they're, they're certainly open. Um, and I think that's certainly the case, um, you know, in, I mean, I, well, the US is a bit more, <laughs> it's a bit more of a tougher dynamic, but, uh, but I think certainly in France, you see yeah. that's very much yeah. Macron's government. Yeah, I was about to say in France we have a great uh, organization, association called France Digital, which is gathering uh, all VCs and startups from the French ecosystem and which is discussing on an everyday basis with the government and uh, lobbying for in the, uh, lobbying, but also helping them, supporting them to uh, you know make the regulation a bit more flexible. So, and we had great success basically in the health tech industry, um, moving a bit the regulation in the financing uh, part of the value chain. So, yeah, doing having great successes. It does feel like this is something that distinguishes Europe from the US in particular. I've taken us on a little bit of an abstract tangent, but I want to come back specifically to retail, and particularly Susan. I know that you mentioned that you have a slightly contrarian outlook and that you are kind of going hard on consumer tech in the minute, or well, that's something that you believe in um, more fervently. I'm really interested in how you got there and, and what you think the, the future looks like for consumer tech and manufacturing. Yeah, I think we are, I mean, part of this is, is down to sort of Felix, um, so I, Felix Capital is a thematically focused fund, and a lot of that is around um, what we call sort of the intersection between uh, lifestyle and technology. So really looking at the opportunities uh, for new uh, propositions, whether it's, it's marketplaces, products and services, um, digitalization of existing industries um, to, and, and software to help you know, people live a better life. Um, and you know, that could be all at, also at work and, uh, and in their sort of personal life. And I think you know, there's been a big shift uh, away from in the venture ecosystem uh, from, from a consumer because you know, there's been obviously some challenging uh, times in the last couple of years and there are some companies that, that haven't scaled uh, as well, although there's others that have scaled very well. And so I think we, you know, we're, I, we, we think, you know, um, there's there's uh, right now a bit of a white space uh, in, in consumer investing, and uh, we're still you know strong believers that you know one it's it's you know consumers power the the economy it's you know over 60% of GDP um, they have a real voice on everything from sustainability to you know uh, what types of brands they want to support how they want to shop um, and that has broad ranging implications and also because their own behavior is changing so rapidly um, you know with with an, um, with a lot of the digital tools that happen today so we're looking at everything from across you know, consumer AI applications, um, which you know, could be in learning, it could be in, um, in healthcare, it could be on, on, um, uh, it, it could be on, on creating um, you know, new, new, uh, new uh, visuals, um, videos, et cetera, to, you know, um, to what are actually new brands that people resonate with, um, to, to new marketplaces and propositions. Uh, and within looking at also uh, across you know different areas from um, from healthcare to financial services and and, uh, and e-commerce. Wow, that's so incredibly comprehensive. I feel like Sorry, yeah. you've just taken us through so much there in just such a short space of time. But some, I mean, something that really stood out is that rapid change is just it's just the complete norm. It's now it's just it's just the state of mind in tech. And so I think that there are so many people now starting out as founders or starting out as investors who. It, the, t the whole scene can just feel completely dizzying. So just to wrap up, if there's one piece of advice that you can give to someone who's thinking of founding a company or, or thinking of like starting to build their own investment thesis, um, what would you say, Aaron? Go ahead and do it, but recognize that you're in for a difficult ride um, at the moment and uh, don't uh, assume that uh, capital will be easy to come by um, in this environment, unless you're doing AI. <laughs> Susan? Yeah, I think I, I, I echo what, what Aaron said. I think the two, two words that we probably try to bring to our own portfolio founders is resilience and focus. Um, but I, we also believe in, in tough times. That's where people demonstrate creativity. I mean, we saw a rise of a lot of great com you know, companies in, after the financial, last financial crisis, and we think that will continue. Nice. Audrey, what do you think? And I will maybe highlight another point, which is building barrier to entry and defensibility. 
uh, I think tech could be a good answer to that, and for very long it has been an answer. But as of today, uh, in a, a period where uh, cookie-less uh, world is, is happening, um, you should also think about building a barrier to entry regarding your knowledge of your customers uh, and um, building communities, creating virality in your product could be also another uh, way of uh, building barriers. This has been so insightful and we've covered so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>